Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Eric Earnhardt and in this lecture I'll be going over some basic principles of rhetoric and research as an overview uh, and to introduce you to some principles or remind you of uh, principles uh, of rhetoric and research that will serve as a foundation for the work that you'll do in this course. So rhetoric comes from the Greek word rhetor, which means orator, uh, but was essentially a lawyer or a senator uh, who made arguments in front of the Greek Senate. Uh, so they were there in order to make laws and debate uh, you know, the best way to move forward as a democracy uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, Aristotle, who wrote the book on rhetoric, uh, as sort of a guidebook uh, for these lawyers or senators, um, defined rhetoric as the best use of the available means of persuasion. He was concerned with the best use, but you know, a good definition is uh, the use of the available means of persuasion in Aristotle's sense. So it's about persuading people. Uh, the Oxford American Dictionary says the art of effective or persuasive speaking or writing, especially the use of figures of speech and other compositional techniques. Modern rhetoricians uh, who study rhetoric will also talk about the visual rhetoric, uh, so images that accompany texts or especially advertising uh, are also attempting to have certain types of persuasive effects on their audiences. So uh, you can think of rhetoric as persuasive writing, speaking, or even images in film. So rhetoric is both what you say and how you say it. Right? Um, and sometimes people will you know, suggest that it's just as important how you say something as it is what you're trying to say. Uh, so you might you know, speak to your friends about a party uh, that you went to last night uh, very differently uh, than how you would speak to your parents about it, and still very differently than how you might speak to your grandparents about it, uh, or a stranger, or something like that. Um, so your audience is very important, and the details that you choose uh, to share, and how you choose to share those details, are going to be very different depending upon what rhetoricians will call your rhetorical situation. So these are the components or elements of a rhetorical situation. Uh, as in the last slide, you have your audience. It could be your friends, your parents, your grandparents, your boss. Um, this is going to affect how, what, what you say and how you say it. So your audience, uh, when I say audience, it's not like an audience in a movie theater. It's just who is being addressed, who is present, or, or who is the person on the receiving end of uh, your rhetoric, right? So in this example, let's just say it's small business owners, okay? So owners of small businesses, that's who I'm talking to. Uh, what's my purpose? Well, maybe I want to persuade these small business uh, owners of something. Um, you know, I could have a different pers uh, purpose. I might want to entertain, right? Or I might want to inform, or uh, I might want to evaluate. Um, all sorts of purposes uh, for speech, right, that occurs, uh, but for this we'll just say, I'm trying to persuade these small business owners, um, you know, so that your purpose is what reason, right, why? Answering the why question. Uh, the context is usually what genre, right, and when I say genre, uh, most people will be familiar with that in terms of books or movies that give a horror genre, or mystery genre, or romantic comedies, uh, different genres of films, right? Um, there's different genres of writing, right? Like if I'm going to write a formal business letter uh, versus a mystery novel versus an academic essay or, uh, or an opinion piece for a newspaper, all of these have their own genre conven conventions. They're generic conventions, things that those sorts of writing do. Uh, if it's a lab report, right, I have to have very specific abstract and um, methods and uh, limitations and conclusions. They're all very specific to that genre. Uh, so all rhetorical situations involve 
the sorts of things that came before it, right? The conventions that it's trying to adhere to or break away from. Uh, so for this example, let's just say that the genre is advertisement, right? So I'm writing some sort of advertisement to persuade small business owners of something. The medium, the medium is the actual physical mode of transfer. Uh, so like people will use, um, like me if you're in a swimming pool, the medium that you're moving through is water, right? Um, the, if we talk about the mass media, right? We, we talk about the media uh, or the mainstream media, right? The media is the uh, journalists and per but particularly the mode of journalism um, that they are operating in, the physical transfer. So it could be a, a online newspaper, could be a print newspaper, could be a news magazine, uh, you know, so all sorts of different uh, media that uh, are being used. So let's just say in this particular advertisement, I'm writing for a web newspaper, right? So it's a online news site. And what's my perspective? Uh, what's the stance uh, of in this situation? Um, so let's say that I want to come off to these small business owners as I persuade them to purchase my goods or services in this newspaper as a compassionate assistant. And I want to help them, right? So I might write something like, let us help you with your workforce needs at this difficult time. Right? To a, it conveys in the tone of the language that's used the stance that I'm taking toward a particular topic. Right? So all of these things together make up the rhetorical situation. And this is something that you want to be aware of in your own writing, uh, but also aware of uh, when you perform analysis or evaluation for your sources to understand what their rhetorical situation is um, so that you can uh, you know, analyze it and, and understand why they're saying something the way they are for that particular audience in that particular time. Um, and so you can be fair right? Uh, or that you can judge them harshly if you think that uh, it's a really poor rhetorical performance, apart from whether or not you actually agree with the ideas being expressed. Uh, this brings us to another aspect of rhetoric, uh, which is rhetorical appeals, right? So in any given rhetorical situation, uh, let's say that I'm still appealing to these small business owners, right? Uh, I'm going to try to construct my language in order to appeal to perhaps the passions or the emotions of these small business owners. Maybe I know that uh, they're in a situation where they might need to lay a lot of workers off and that they're conflicted about that and I want to come off as compassionate so maybe I tell a little story about uh, the difficulties being faced by workers um, and how we can help um, the small business owners protect their workers at this time right um, so that's sort of appealing to their sense of emotion their pathos um, you know maybe I uh, maybe I even include a, a picture uh, of uh, you know a boss shaking hands with someone who's looking sad or, or uh, hopeful or something like that right this would be a way of appealing to that passion and emotion um, I also want to make sure that I as a writer of this advertisement come off as ethical, right? I don't want to look like some shady fly-by-night salesman just trying to make a buck. I want to appear trustworthy, ethical, and authoritative, that I know what I'm talking about, right? So maybe, you know, first off, I want to make sure that um, my writing is, is good, that it's correct, uh, that it's clear, uh, that it has no errors, uh, so that I don't look like I'm just throwing this together. Uh, maybe I want to cite some authoritative voices, uh, trusted voices, um, 
I want to make sure that my design uh, looks good um, and that uh, I've sort of demonstrated competency um, and professionalism in my words uh, and in my citations. And then finally, there's the appeal to logic. Right, so I don't want to say anything or do anything um, that is clearly illogical or unreasonable. Uh, I don't want to make promises that go beyond what I can deliver on. Right, if it's an advertisement, say I can make all your wildest dreams come true. Uh, that is not going to be logical. It's not going to be consistent uh, with my purpose, uh, and people are going to then be suspicious of me. Um, so these are rhetorical appeals because they're ways to appeal to, to make yourself appealing to your audience. And these are all coming from Aristotle, and Aristotle liked things in threes. So we have pathos, ethos, and logos as the different types of rhetorical appeals. And then we also have different types of rhetoric. This sort of gets to the, the context piece of a rhetorical situation. Any given rhetorical situation uh, is going to do, generally speaking, one of three things. Um, it's going to, if it's forensic rhetoric, uh, just like a uh, forensic uh, scientist in you know, some crime show will try to establish the facts at the crime scene, uh, forensic rhetoric tries to establish facts. Uh, it's past focused, meaning it's concerned with things that happened already um, and sort of reconstructing that like a judge who decides in a case he has to make those evaluations and judgments um, based on the evidence. Uh, so this is also called judicial rhetoric. Right? Uh, deliberative rhetoric is more like the kind of thing that I talked about at the beginning, where it's the senators, it's the lawyers, they're deciding uh, on a topic or a proposal, maybe it's a new law or policy uh, or a new direction for a, a business or a movement or a organization, uh, and there are differences of opinion, and um, they're more future-focused, uh, and they are still very reasoned. They look at the past, uh, but they're concerned about uh, the future. I'm going to butcher this pronunciation uh, because it's Greek, but this is a type of rhetoric that in Greek is called symbolutikon, I believe. <laughs> uh, this one I know uh, how to pronounce better. It's called epidictic rhetoric, uh, and these are proclamations either at or about an event, a particular occasion, uh, like a wedding or a funeral, where you will hear speeches um, or any other type of ceremony uh, where uh, a particular type of uh, speech or words are meant to be spoken, whether it's a prayer or um, you know, speech that's uh, rehearsed in some way or, or that's even uh, new for every, so the Gettysburg Address, right, would be um, epideictic rhetoric or occasional rhetoric, um, political speech at a particular occasion or, or even, you know, ceremonial or religious speech. Uh, the famous example um, in uh, Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar, where Mark Antony says, friends, Romans, countrymen, give, lend me your ears. Um, and it begins as a sort of epideptic um, speech after Caesar's death, right? So a funer funeral speech, which is just sort of meant to, uh, you know, honor the fallen uh, leader, uh, but that actually winds up being a sort of, um, you know, call to revolution front of the people, uh, you know, so uh, that would be epideictic rhetoric that sort of turned into perhaps deliberative rhetoric saying, here's what we need to do, makes a proposal, let's take up arms, this was a great leader, he was unjustly killed. Um, so these are three different types of rhetoric, uh, and what we mostly will deal with uh, in composition classes uh, in our our main genre, right, the the genre that is produced uh, in the academy in many of your other classes, particularly in languages, humanities, uh, social, behavioral sciences, um, are 
research papers, uh, and these inherently uh, have uh, ideas that you're attempting to advance uh, that operate along the lines of logical arguments. So academic papers employ high quality research for the purpose of establishing facts, so forensic rhetoric, or persuading other researchers of the value or quality of their subject matter. So deliberative, right? You're making a value statement or quality judgment uh, about the subject matter, looking sort of forward focused uh, on how people should think about it. You're trying to persuade people to think about something in a certain way uh, based on the research and the history and facts. So they do so primarily by making logical claims, uh, so arguments, right, based on logos, the appeal to logos, uh, followed by strong and consistent reasons and evidence drawn from their research. And this is all done while maintaining an authoritative ethos, ethics, trustworthiness, authority, by writing clearly in an appropriate tone and with meticulous attribution and citation. Attributing meaning uh, you're, you're saying where your sources uh, come from, uh, you're saying where your quotes come from, where your facts come from, you're, you're giving credit where credit is due to your other sources and you're citing it carefully uh, according to the conventions, whether it's APA or MLA, uh, so that other researchers are able to follow uh, where you got that information and check it out for themselves to ensure that they can trust uh, your research. So here's an example um, that sort of breaks down the particular pieces or elements of an argument. Uh, so an argument will usually begin with a main claim uh, or thesis that is the what of the statement, this is true. Right, so it's trying to establish the truth of a, an assertion or the idea that you're trying to advance. The next part uh, is the reason. Why? Right? Why is this true? Well, because. Right? And then you say what follows that because uh, is your reason. Right, uh, And then after that you actually provide the evidence. Right? Um, so how do I know that this is true? Right? It's, it sounds plausible, but what, is the, what are the actual practical things that follow from that that will allow me to be convinced uh, that this is true and not just a good sounding idea? Uh, so some examples, some evidence, um, you know, f uh, some statistics, um, all of these things would, would help, right? So here's an example. So masks can decrease the chance of contracting COVID-19 by 500% because of their ability to keep contaminated air from spreading to others when distance is maintained. All right, so we have in that first sentence both a claim and then after the because, we have reasons, right? Uh, at least one reason, because they're able to keep contaminated air from spreading. Um, but we have a qualifier on that reason, which is only when distance is maintained, right? So this phenomenon has been observed in labs, as well in reduced cases of disease where mass guidelines are followed. All right, so we have at least two examples there. So in labs and in the real world, if we're judging by uh, disease being reduced, where mask guidelines are followed, uh, those are two examples that would lead us to believe that masks maybe are, as we have already asserted uh, in our thesis, able to decrease the chance of contracting COVID uh, by 500%. There's still a lot there that would need to be fleshed out for those who are skeptical in order to be fully convinced, uh, but this is at least a good overarching thesis that includes these three elements, claims, reasons, evidence. Um, this is the basic form of an argument, and it's repeated and done over and over again, basically in each paragraph that follows uh, sort of has the structure. We have a, a subclaim, more reasons, more evidence, uh, and all leading back to the original main claim or main thesis that you're trying to advance. So how do we 
begin this process of uh, research, right? So you've uh, had this idea um, and you want to really dive in, um, you know, in, in uh, rhetoric and research one, English 101, uh, you write a bunch of different types of papers that, um, you know, vary from asking you to just sort of narrate perhaps a, a personal uh, narrative to uh, summarizing to analyzing to arguing um, in English 102 rhetoric and research 2 the research project is larger and it spans the entire course uh, asking you to really dive into and develop a single research project that can actually begin to become conversant enough with the conversation around a topic that is happening uh, among the professionals uh, that you have something to contribute, that you become a part of that larger scholarly conversation around a topic. So it has to be uh, important enough or big enough um, that uh, you know researchers are still uh, writing on it, right? Um, but that it has to be small enough that within the uh, term of one semester, you you are able to gain enough information on it uh, in order to say something important about it. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, the first step is to develop a research question. So this is the question about the topic you're interested in that will help to guide your research. Right? So whenever you are you know finding more and more information on a topic uh, and so much of it is so interesting but if it doesn't help you to answer your question uh, then it's not something that you need to spend a whole lot of time on uh, something that might have to wait until you have more time later uh, to research uh, in that area but once you have that good research question, then you can go out, you can go to the library, you can go to the library databases, uh, you can go to um, you know, the uh, books uh, that you can get your hands on, and you can conduct your initial research. That initial research is going to do one of two things. It's either going to confirm the hunch that you already had, the stance that you already had about your topic uh, when you wrote your research question, uh, or it's going to challenge it. And you're going to realize that you didn't know quite a lot uh, about that topic, uh, not so much as you thought you did, and it's going to change your opinion somewhat. And at this point, uh, you have enough information, probably, that you can form some sort of preliminary thesis. So it's a, a main claim that now that you have a little bit more information, uh, you probably have a sense of where you fall uh, on this topic and perhaps particularly um, you know, in, a, in a specific area uh, of this topic, and you're ready to make that stance. You're ready to write down your thesis, which is really the answer to your research question. Uh, the, the answer that you maybe already thought you knew, but that now you can say with more um, uh, confidence, or perhaps uh, you know, your answer that has changed uh, from what you thought at the beginning. So once you have that preliminary thesis, then you have to decide, okay, within the span of these next weeks, uh, what can I realistically write? Um, you know, what can I tackle uh, in my research paper? This is going to be realistic for me within the scope of the assignment and what I think I will be able to contribute to this topic uh, based on what has already been written and the amount of time that I have to write something new. Um, and what do I want to try to, to convince people of in that small period of time? Uh, what is, what's the purpose? Do I just want to analyze? Do I want to evaluate? Do I want to inform? So coming up with a plan for the scope and purpose of the project uh, is important. Um, and that can include brainstorming, it can include outlining uh, and pre-writing and all those sorts of things, um, and actually writing a proposal uh, for the, the scope and purpose of the project. Once you have that done, uh, then you want to go back to the books, go back to your research, um, 
and fill in any holes, right? Find any uh, places where you may need more information in order to complete the scope of that project uh, and the purpose of that project. And also make sure that you're not cherry picking, uh, that you're not looking for only things that confirm your position, but things that may also uh, challenge your position opposing views, uh, voices that are going to um, consider what your stance uh, on this topic is as uh, objectionable, uh, and include them as well uh, so that you're able to adequately respond to them later. Uh, then you're going to want to find the sources that are most relevant and most important, and you're going to review them and evaluate them rigorously. Um, so that you know exactly what they're saying. You can speak to them authoritatively uh, with context uh, and with eloquence, um, and you know their weaknesses and strengths as well. Uh, once you've done all that, you're really ready to give it a go. Uh, try to complete a rough draft. This is where you're basically just getting all of your ideas out there. You're trying your best to create material that you can go back to later and edit. It doesn't have to be clean, it doesn't have to be polished, it just has to be done. Uh, you can finish that rough draft. Ideally, you have a little bit of time to put it away uh, so that you can come back to it with fresh eyes uh, and read it over again and decide, uh, oh my gosh, what idiot wrote this paper? Uh, but much more likely, oh, what genius put these ideas down um, and then, you know, what has to be done, right? How do I revise it um, in order to fix things here or there or pull out the brilliance uh, of this one idea that is actually the, the uh, you know, the main nugget of wisdom uh, that I didn't perceive at the beginning uh, that now I know is the, the heart of the paper. Um, you have to revise accordingly, right? So this is the time where you make those big changes uh, that are going to sort of change the scope uh, or the purpose of the paper somewhat. And then once you've done that work, then it's time to finish the final draft by going through and polishing it up, making sure that your reader doesn't have to work too hard uh, to get your meanings, that nothing's too confusing, that things follow a logical order, um, and that your grammar and mechanics, your citation and your attribution and all those sorts of things uh, are, are done well. And then when you're done with that, you're ready to submit it for review and for publication. Uh, so for this class, uh, you know, you'll be submitting that to me uh, for grading uh, and for uh, feedback uh, towards any sort of revision uh, that's required. So those are the steps of the research uh, process. It sounds like a lot, um, but uh, we'll go through it, uh, you know, in stages uh, until we come up with something uh, at the end of the course uh, that will be interesting, that you will know a lot about, and that you can be proud of when you leave the course uh, as something that you've produced uh, and learned about and you'll be more familiar uh, with doing the type of research that's going to help you throughout uh, your college career uh, as well as your professional one. Thanks for watching.